Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, as discussed in the uh, Orientalist exploitation, we tend to look at uh, in the discipline of anthropology from the point of the predator prey uh, metaphors. If you look at, uh, usually ethnographers are in a way uh, engaged in trying to gather some kind of information or sort of trying to uh, look at as if uh, they are on an, a hunting expedition in trying to find uh, the prey that is the animals. So, this sort of uh, the discourse which is being followed uh, by the oriental ethnographers in trying to make sense or understand the native societies mostly is that it stands to be you know looked at the lens of these uh, the predator and prey uh, sort of relationship or or maybe we can say metaphors. Now, as uh, Malinowski has uh, rightly argued that uh, for instance, the ethnographers uh, tends to uh, normally uh, spread the kind of uh, nets in the right place and wait for what will fall into them. And in, in that case, he plays the role of uh, an active huntsman and uh, through this, he, he tends to drive his quarry into the follow it up and most inaccessible layers. Now, uh, moving on, uh, the orientalist ethnographers uh, sort of tends to uh, forcefully uh, move into looking at this uh, perspective by employing this uh, idea of a universalist discourse. So, in a way this sort of imagination of being uh, that feeling of that superiority uh, in relation to the society, the societies which they are studying. Now, therefore, this sort of uh, a preconceived notion of how that they tends to sort of have this dominance or sort of the ethnocentric uh, presumption or ideas against other communities is pretty much uh, involved in the, the imagination of these orientalist uh, ethnographers. Now, by seeing this or as we discussed we tends to locate that uh, anthropologists uh, tends to be looked at or perceived as as if uh, it is the offspring of some kind of the western colonialism or the western colonialist or maybe someone has rightly pointed out saying that anthropology is the bastard child of colonialism. Now, this predominance this idea of uh, sort of uh, dominance is guided by the idea of objectivist, if not uh, uh, obje objectivist idea of this western science. We tends to you know for quite long this has been the obsession, the obsession of uh, the ethnographers. If you look at the history of this, uh, the discipline, particularly anthropology. Now, this relationship, the engagement of the field worker that is the ethnographers and can be in a way uh, said to be a relationship between uh, the translator and the author. Uh, not just as I pointed out, not just in terms of the predator-prey relationship, but also they tend to engage in 
certain kind of uh, a violent sexual language, which I have uh, pointed out uh, the Baconian theory of sexual axiom. So, this sort of othering, if not trying to objectify uh, the community with or the subject which they are looking at, tends to have certain kind of uh, this uh, the branding of uh, that community something from the point of a violent sexual language or metaphors. The, the content of uh, this source text is mostly represented as passive and uh, sort of a weaker sex that is the female prey to be in a way controlled and appropriated by a male translator. So, it, it can be in a way looked at the female and the male relationship, wherein the male has <coughs> overriding power or authority in terms of controlling and translating in the way they like and uh, they do not really give a space and the prey in a way becomes just a representation of the passive, whereas the male that is the ethnographers who plays an active role of a huntsman tends to engage in uh, interpreting uh, in a different mode. Now, uh, as you can see uh, globally also uh, in, in, in the available or the existing literature, the kind of uh, industrial exploitation which is taking place normally tends to uh, consider the natural resources as something which is wild and then which needs to be tamed uh, or, or rather which needs to be sort of civilized. And this imagination in a way is uh, guided by the idea of as if the wild is something which is uh, un undomesticated and this perhaps in a way uh, sort of uh, proof that or it is evident that uh, the, the, this is sort of the characteristic uh, which is normally uh, embedded in the envir environmental orientalism. Now, for example, if you look at the literature on uh, the fishing economies, for example, uh, often there is this notion of aggressive stands which, uh, which are normally being taken by the uh, fisherman, uh, which is rightly pointed out by Pelson in his extensive study uh, among the Icelandic communities. That is the Icelandic fishing economy is perhaps uh, uh, a case in point. Now, during this engagement of uh, a fishing economy, uh, you tends to look at the sea in a way represented uh, a kind of a gigantic and uh, a continuous mass of energy which requires to be sort of tame and then or looked upon actively as uh, and, and which is seen to be uh, in a more offensive manner by the humans that is uh, where one needs to exert certain kind of uh, energy and force uh, to put it more specifically and by those males uh, who are almost at war with the ecosystem as if uh, the fisherman in a way engaged in uh, a continuous struggle uh, to in a way prove their masculinity over the C that is in terms of capturing and then trying to exploit. So, this sort of offensive nature uh, in a way is uh, pretty much evident in the context of the uh, fishing practices which are normally being practiced in, the, uh, in Iceland. Now, uh, in a way if you look at this uh, uh, the kind of uh, intensity which is usually 
being a witness in the context of this environmental orientalism and sort of its uh, the kind of consequences they have delivered, one can in a way tries to look at uh, the inherent challenges if not the problems which is normally being encountered. Now, in this context, the producers in a way uh, expect a certain kind of uh, a control in totality by their own practices and uh, in the process they tends to sort of undermine their mastery sometimes bringing the species they exploit to near deplacement. So, this condition or this idea of uh, the de depletion of the species or the ecosystem is uh, never border or never in the discourse of the fishing economy. Now, therefore, this sort of idea of controlling and the kind of practices which they have engaged uh, into uh, tends to uh, impact it a lot in the ecosystem. And, and these resources are seen to be sort of uh, with that idea of uh, as if it cannot be depleted. Now, if we can uh, if we employ the metaphor of this irony uh, even in a more ironical manner the this face with the realities of this the resource uh, depletion people sometimes in a way adopt the fatalistic attitude that depletion is simply an inevitable ingredient of economic progress. So, in a way uh, the kind of economic progress or uh, development in a way is seen to be you know uh, two sides of the same coin with the depletion of uh, resources. So, they are in a way guided by this premises of uh, uh, depletion uh, with a with uh, development or economic progress. So, this tends to be uh, pretty much ironical in the true sense of the term. Now, how does one engage in this fatalistic attitude? Now, for instance, uh, the normal traditional practices of fishing in a way is less harmful compared to the uh, more uh, commercialized form of fishing that is by using heavy machines like trawlers, wherein you tends to uh, not just uh, fish out, but also in the process you affect the other species which are pretty much inherent in that particular ecosystem that is the sea. Now, moving on the, as we have discussed uh, what sort of ideas or normally the principles which guides the paradigms of orientalism is and how this orient uh, with the, uh, the subject of this uh, anthropology in a way is for quite long being guided by these orientalist ideas that is how uh, uh, it, it is seen as the offspring of colonialism and how it is being guided by the objectivist western science uh, notion of perception at the same time imagining the other that is uh, the community which are pretty much uh, uh, closely uh, inhabiting uh, the nature. Now, this sort of uh, ideas for quite long has sort of guided the ethics of anthropology. And uh, now, uh, we would be looking at uh, uh, the different paradigm that is paternalism. Now, as I had uh, already uh, briefly pointed out what paternalism is, it in a way involve uh, sort of uh, giving a preference to uh, the scientific knowledge that is we tends to uh, give more space to this the scientific expertise and uh, inversion to the relative power of experts and 
the lay persons, we tend to categorize or sort of draw a boundary between the formal and the informal knowledge. And uh, the formal knowledge as I had pointed out is normally uh, the written one and the informal knowledge that is of the lay persons is mostly oral and then it is unwritten. Now, if you look at in the modern environmentalist view, humans in a way have this uh, particular responsibility to meet, to meet what? Not only uh, to other humans, but also to other members of other species that is uh, to fellow inhabitants of the animal kingdom and the ecosystem of the globe. So, that sort of interaction is in a way inevitable and uh, how uh, the humans in a way plays the role of being uh, responsible. Now, this idea of this paternalism again is guided by uh, that sort of uh, restricting uh, the freedom and uh, having the sole responsibility of caring and nurturing not just uh, the other human beings, but also uh, the other species. So, that sort of authoritarian uh, dogmas in a way has guided this uh, environmentalist view. Now, they tend to sort of uh, uh, as they have shown some kind of a dominance and uh, if not uh, a control over other humans, similarly they tend to employ that sort of principles uh, when they interact, if not uh, they share their kind of relationship with other uh, species that is the animal kingdom. Now, this modern environmentalist movement uh, in a way engages by uh, fetishizing nature. Now, in the process they tend to sort of uh, demarcate uh, the world of humans and nature. And uh, they tend to presume that uh, humans are in a way acting on behalf of nature and therefore, that sort of uh, the dichotomy or dichotomous relationship is being established between human and nature. Now, if you look at uh, some of the uh, principles uh, which guide the uh, radical ecologies, uh, for example, uh, the animal rights group. Now, they, they, they tend to sort of become something which are more akin to the activities of the uh, left revolutionaries that is uh, who engage in uh, delivering justice if not uh, who are pretty much radical in their stance and uh, they, they tend to uh, perceive or uh, deliver or a change uh, in a very hasp or maybe overnight and this sort of revolutionary ideas which was pretty much active in the 19th century tends to presume this nature uh, not the oppressed pol proletariat, but it is the beneficiary. Now, uh, this is what Bennett has argued and the animal rights activists in a way are being trapped with the notion of this objectivist western discourse in sci on science and the other and which often uh, tends to make uh, a fundamental or uh, a primary distinctions between them that is the indigenous producers and uh, that is the us that is the euro american that I, that that sort of demarcation of uh, them and us is always uh, pretty much inherent and uh, if you look at the sort of the in the in, in the present day like the petas who in a way tends to you know uh, by sidelining human rights, they tend to take up the issue of the animals for instance and uh, in, in, in the process they tend to compromise with the rights of humans in order to safeguard and protect uh, the animals. So, there is this sort of 
uh, practices are in a way uh, radicals in nature and uh, we can use the term radical ecologies to brand this group of activists in a way. Now, uh, in the academic discourse it is important to engage in this textual translation right and uh, what is this textual translation then? Now, Jacques Derrida uh, uh, tends to you know uh, use this term called the translation contract, wherein he defined that uh, this translation contract is nothing but sort of a uh, hymen or marriage contract with the promise to produce uh, a child whose seed will give rise to history and growth. So, this sort of uh, an alliance which is uh, seen to be uh, sort of uh, made between uh, a man and a woman, wherein uh, they will uh, ultimately engage in producing a child, which will in a way uh, continue the kind of uh, evolution of hum humankind. Now, Derrida tends to see this textual translation that is the translator and the author in terms of this uh, alliance called the translation contract, wherein two mutually agreed to have a contract and engage in trying to deliver some kind of uh, what is being appropriate to them. Now, only some segments of this humanity in a way uh, are categorized to belong to closely to nature. That is as if uh, only a particular region or a community is separated and uh, they are tends to be sort of uh, have that belongingness to nature. And uh, those reported to love animals and take care of their environment are uh, popularly termed, termed to be you know who are uh, primitive which are far from civilization and uh, who tends to have this uh, a culture of uh, civilization uh, or who are in a way uh, far away from the state control or the state or the modern state. Now, these sort of uh, ideas in a way if you see in the context of India we have some anthropologists like Vir Alvin, Christopher Hamandov. Uh, Hamandov, in a way, has uh, or uh, Alvin Virier, who have closely examined the life of the Baiga, and ultimately, uh, these ethnographers come up with an idea that uh, these primitive or tribals should be, in a way, uh, seen to be in isolation or their culture or their way of life should remain untouched. So, in the discourse of uh, tribal society that sort of uh, approach has emerged which is known as the isolationist, isolationist approach has emerged as a result of the works of particularly Vera Alvin and uh, Ham, uh, Christopher Hamendov. Now, why do they tend to come up with this idea? Because there is an inherent idea which is pretty much embedded, because they tend to evaluate and go the societies which they study, because they tend to have that paternalistic kind of attitude, that notion of uh, predominance over the culture which they study, and that culture which they have interacted and studied are seen to be inferior and uh, primitive and which are far from civilization. Therefore, they need to be uh, sort of preserved in a museum. Now, this sort of anthropological discourse was pretty much active in the pre-colonial, uh, uh, pre-independence period and then all throughout uh, even the for quite some time in the post independence period, but uh, this sort of isolationist approach are again challenged by Gourier and others 
uh, by coming with uh, a different idea that is more of an integrationist and uh, uh, assimilationist approach of looking at the tribals. Now, as a result of this, uh, we could actually see uh, many of the Adivasis which are being Hinduized and once they become Hinduized, they fall within the Hindu caste system and uh, sort of uh, a reinvention of identity is taking place. But that is not the end, but uh, in reverse to this, there is also uh, uh, sort of a reinvention among the tribals themselves taking place. Uh, therefore, in the process as a result of the kind of uh, affirmative action which is enshrined in the constitutions, uh, which uh, sort of tends to safeguard the interests of uh, the tribal's culture and identity, which in a way uh, many tribal communities are today uh, asserting a separate if not to protect their identity because uh, of this affirmative action. Now, uh, this sort of uh, ideas in a way uh, of branding uh, a particular community as who are close to nature and who are taking care of their biodiversity are tends to be uh, perceived as primitive and sort of the children of nature that is natural walker that uh, in German. Now, this children of nature, how do we categorize this then? This sort of taxonomy if not classification of uh, we and us or they and uh, us in a way is assumed that the translator in a way uh, is engaged with as if they have at certain point of time or states uh, have uh, left the state of nature. So, in a way this is guided by the evolution I evolutionary ideas that human has evolved and then there are certain communities who are at the states of civilization or modern society and there are still other groups who are close to nature as primitive and still far from civilization. So, this sort of ideas or categorizing of or dividing or classifying people can be in a way uh, seen to be pretty much guided by the idea of the deterministic and uh, the ecological models which are in a way again presumed to be applied to only some societies which are notably still practicing uh, the foraging uh, practices that is hunting and gathering societies. Now, if you looked at uh, or examine closely rather the peasants who are often uh, seen to be you know uh, primitive or who are sought to, sought seen to be children of nature are in a way have are, is guided or been practicing the environmental relations in terms of this protection and reciprocity. Now, by using this term protection and reciprocity, it is an ongoing engagement with nature, because they tend to presume nature as a provider of their day to day basic needs. And in the process, uh, they also the, this human uh, societies tend to engage in certain sort of uh, protection or maybe vice versa. Now, significantly this sort of relations between human and their land or the ecological needs which they have inhabited are often models in terms of a certain kinds of uh, social bonding and uh, uh, so to say among uh, a distant relatives which are in a, in a way again characterized by the ethos of uh, respect and formality which in a way is pretty much balanced and uh, which cannot again be simply generalized uh, or seen to be uh, from the gates of 
reciprocity. Now, these sort of uh, ethics and values are pretty much inherent uh, with the people who are in close relationship with the uh, uh, soiled if not the ecological needs they are inhabiting. Now, for example, again if you looked at the uh, case of this the Icelandic fishing, this patterns of paternalism is in a way represent the current application of scientific rationality to fisheries management. Now, by engaging in uh, using the up to date if not uh, technology, you are in a way uh, trying to give a space to this uh, the scientific rationality, because you tend to see that uh, with the help of science, you can in a way maximize the product or maybe you are sort of engaging in some kind of uh, a balance to the ecosystem. Now, this sort of scientific rationality is also uh, to be seen in the context of the modern forestry management. Now, uh, as I have uh, cited uh, this example of the forest policies which are guiding uh, the Indian uh, environment in a way is also something which is being borrowed from the uh, European colonialist wherein forest is seen as uh, more of in a very scientific manner. Now, therefore, uh, uh, as a result of which they tend to engage in uh, planting more uh, gas uh, related if not forestry which should in a way deliver or maybe commercialization of forest. Now, in this process, uh, people tends to engage in like monocropping, mono uh, which in a way has a good return in the market. Now, uh, this sort of ideas which has driven the uh, forestry practices in India has far reaching impact on the communities who are pretty much. Uh, living in close proximity or who share sort of a close relationship with uh, their land or who has a sort of affinity with the ecological needs which they have inhabited for generations has sort of a far reaching impact on them. Now, in this process uh, they in a way has affected uh, in the pursuit of this commercialization of forest. Uh, their means of basic livelihoods are being affected and many have in a way has uh, lost their means of livelihood and as a result of this uh, a lot of this involuntary displacement or migration takes place. Now, this is something which needs to be looked at when we tend to you know apply this scientific rationality in terms of any kind of natural resource management and uh, the Icelandic fishing is also a case in point which is uh, strongly uh, argued by Pelson in his study that uh, by engaging in this uh, the scientific rationality that perception of uh, looking at sea is to be seen as something which needs to be sort of tame and then when you have to you know like forcibly engage to extract something out of it. Now, that sort of uh, relationship has set up as a result of this engagement. Now, while this fisherman in a way has continuously engaged in uh, appropriating their prey, uh, in a sense they in, uh, and, uh, in a way involve in removing it from the natural domain. That is that whole idea of uh, sustainability is being affected, because the whole 
ecosystem or the species is affected by separating them from that of humans. That is the scientific uh, management uh, tends to uh, engage in extracting uh, this sort of practices wherein the fish is normally seen to be uh, you know to which, which, which has to sort of satisfy the needs of humans. Now, as a result of this the fishermen have uh, increasingly become uh, driven by this techno scientific knowledge and as a result of this they have sort of dominated uh, the nature and this idea of uh, scientific rationality has guided the fisherman. Now, one of the chief uh, you know uh, architects of this paternalistic regime of uh, protective fishing and the uh, present system of individual transferable uh, quotas that is uh, the agents like the economies, the biologists and other policy makers often uh, tends to remain firmly committed to more of a, mod a modernist discourse and in the, pro in the process they tend to take the stance of this objectivist ideas. Now, these are some of the kind of uh, paternalistic ideas or the modern environmentalist uh, architect which in a way has sort of hampered if not uh, are pretty much uh, hell bent and uh, uh, they, they, they take this stance to sort of satisfy their needs. Now, if you try to see paternalism in a more uh, moral framework, uh, there is an increasing awareness among people about the ecological impact which they have sort of cause and as a result of engaging with this uh, pat paternalistic uh, uh, mechanisms, their action has in a way tends to seek and to organize themselves in redressing the balance that is the metaphor of these the comic plot may seem and appropriate one. Now, moving on the, from these uh, paradigms of paternalism wherein uh, uh, those uh, who practices these paternalistic ideas are pretty much uh, engaged with the scientific knowledge and uh, uh, guided by the objectivist uh, western science and um, uh, rationalities. Uh, we move on to looking at what communalism is and what is the paradigm of these uh, communalisms uh, trying to challenge if not rejects mostly the ideas of uh, orientalism and paternalism and first and foremost this paradigm in a way rejects the separation of nature and society and also the notions of these uh, certainty and monologue and it has consistently uh, emphasizes uh, the contingency and dialogue because there if one has to look at uh, the relationship between nature and society there has to be some kind of a discourse uh, and uh, how the kind of relationship has to be historicized uh, by engaging in a different approach of ethnographic understanding. Now, unlike uh, paternalism, the communalism in a way uh, tends to propound the idea of uh, uh, generalizing this reciprocity that is an exchange which uh, often uh, metaphorically re represents in terms of uh, you know intimate personal relationship. Now, when we talk about the intimate personal relationship, you tend to look at uh, more of a subjective interpretive, interpretive understanding of 
uh, the contextually uh, and uh, not just uh, on a superficial uh, objectivist uh, understanding of uh, this relationship. Therefore, one cannot really generalize this idea of reciprocity and uh, in the process it is important, uh, it is pertinent to uh, develop a different kind of e ecological theory that sort of tends to encompass uh, uh, human ecology and social theory. Now, why is this social theory important? Because uh, as we had discussed, the way we treat other human beings uh, tends to reflect on the kind of relationship which we share on nature. Therefore, uh, the reinvention or readdressing the problems of uh, society is important and once you come up with a uh, different kind of a social theory uh, and in the process you can be able to come up with uh, a different notion of uh, an ecological theory. Now, how does one derive at uh, framing a different social theory by only sort of uh, abandoning uh, a radical stance uh, that is uh, the distinctions between nature and society uh, which is pretty much uh, uh, recognized in the present time. Now, this social theory in a way was proposed earlier uh, in the writing of the young Marx, who in a way insisted that humans cannot be afford to be or to be seen in separation from nature and uh, conversely uh, that nature could not be separated from, from humans. Nature he therefore argues that uh, taken abstractly for itself nature is fixed in isolation from man is nothing uh, from man is nothing for man. Now, this sort of uh, uh, scientific praxis, if not the theory of this praxis or practice, which are informed both uh, in the writings of Marx that uh, this perspective of this pragmatism uh, includes that of Dewey, and uh, which in a way strongly asserts and then emphasize on uh, these ideas. Now, this theory of practice uh, began with the writings of Marx and then later on popularized by Dewey. Now, what does this theory of practice talks about? Now, this theory in a way uh, provide a new perspective uh, that in a way resonates uh, the paradigm of uh, communalism while dismissing the dualism of experts and uh, lay persons, that is the sort of demarcation between the formal and the informal knowledge has to be in a way dismissed, because it, it, it sort of uh, offers a new hope or a challenges by engaging in a compelling view on how people acquire the skills necessary for managing their lives. Uh, as D. V. puts it, from knowing as a factor in action and undergoing. Now, therefore, it is important to look at the kind of skills which are pretty much occur in close relationship with nature. I, I have at length discussed about in goals uh, understanding of uh, the enskillment and how uh, they, they tend to develop uh, sort of a knowledge uh, in close relationship with the environment where a community uh, has uh, sort of inhabited for quite some time. Now, this theory of practice also again draws our attention to uh, us how to look at the master apprentice relationship. Uh, one, one in a way should not uh, necessarily engage in always the predator pre relationship, but also uh, to look at this 
the master apprentice relations and the kind of uh, communities which engage in this practice uh, to which they uh, are closely associated with that is in this end thing the study of human action. Now, uh, these are some ideas which are again uh, borrowed from Goodman and Pelson's work. Now, why is it important to look at this uh, wider perspective of uh, the community's practice in which they belong? Because through this uh, continuous engagement with the environment, a certain kind of knowledge is being developed and, and skills are being developed in sort of uh, the continuous process of this protection and reciprocity is being witnessed in this discourse. Now, this sort of perspective that is this theory of practice not only provides a useful antidote to methodological individualism, but also uh, a proper you know, unit of analysis is no longer and something which is autonomous to the individual that is the separation from the social world, but rather the whole person in action that is the individual in action which is acting within the uh, context of that activity. So, that sort of uh, uh, anthropocentric ideas is being dismissed and rather human or a person is seen to be a dot if not a unit in this whole uh, networks or context. So, this idea of this biocentrism in a way is uh, uh, a proper way approach in these units of analysis. Now, if you look at the relationship between the anthropologists and their ethnographic field work with Avis how do we try to an inject this idea of uh, communalism and then what communalism stands for. Now, uh, usually in the field work, uh, an anthropologist normally uh, engage in encountering uh, their host that is uh, the subject of their study or the cultural group which one is looking at. And Therefore, continually these anthropologists are uh, engaging in uh, a kind of a meaningful uh, dialogue with their host. That is in this process, they share some kind of uh, reciprocal enterprises that is the inhabitants of a single world. Now, why is it important uh, to look at this textual translation rather? not just as a predator prey uh, perspective, but rather as uh, more of a reciprocal enterprises. Now, this engagement is meaningful because uh, it is the guest and the host and through this interaction, one is trying to derive some ideas and meanings through this. So, there are also possibilities of uh, being pretty much biased in terms of interpretation. Now, therefore, uh, many of the works, many of the anthropologists tends to you know come up, come up with certain kind of conclusion. Uh, for instance, uh, the kind of food habits, one the, for example, if you take the examples of the uh, context of Northeast India, wherein most tribals are known for engaging in the culture of this uh, head hunting. Normally, in head hunting, uh, a community engages in raiding the other fellow tribes and then uh, they bring back the heads of those enemies and which is seen to be uh, sort of a prized possession and the enemy's head are uh, sort of uh, seen as trophies. Now, this sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, interpreting from the European anthropological discourse is again misleading, because uh, it is not just about 
that uh, tribals are normally engaging in simply uh, craving for you know the body of uh, a human but rather uh, if you see from the gates of the within that is the uh, native societies in a way this sort of practices is uh, more to do with uh, checks and balances or to bring certain kind of or a test of masculinity. So, that sort of uh, engagement where the host community usually represent has to be in a way uh, interpret in that particular context and, and, and not seen as and not to be seen as something which is uh, sort of uh, as a tradition of uh, warring practices or uh, sort of a savage cultural practices. Now, uh, the basic uh, importance of uh, this discourse ethics is uh, pointed out by Habermas and Habermas in a way refers this, this re re discourse ethics of the idle speech situation which is more of a general communicative strategy for recognizing the differences and solving conflicts. Now, this ideal speech situation is important in the sort of the ethnographic fieldwork wherein anthropologists are engaged because uh, this is where the kind of uh, uh, an exchange of ideas, if not wherein. Uh, the field worker tends to sort of decode or interpret the ideas or practices of uh, action uh, which is embedded in that particular communities. Now, field work according to Goodman and Rivera in a way again emphasizes uh, that, uh, that it is a continuous conversation that is a discourse. And through this, an anthropologist in a way tends to produce their ethnography with a responding people. Because normally, you, when you go to the field and uh, normally in the anthropologists and socialists engage in certain kind of discussion, interview, by being a participant and a non-participant observer. Now, therefore, this sort of continuous engagement of the anthropologists is important in order to you know produce their data which is known as the ethnography. Once again there are also uh, you know an obvious parallels in terms of a literary discourse. So, this sort of textual translation is uh, important uh, in terms of uh, in, in especially in the ethnographic study. Now, Bert and David in a way also shows that uh, uh, the group of these hunters and gatherers uh, metaphorically extend uh, this idea of uh, communalism. How? Because in their relations uh, among humans to the realm of environmental domain, thereby projecting an image of uh, the giving environment. Now, again, why is this? Uh, the social life in a way uh, re uh, reflecting on the en en environmental relations is because uh, usually uh, these native communities are more or less guided by the ethos of this communitarianism and egalitarianism. Now, this sort of uh, egalitarianism in a way where there is no class divisions among individuals they tends that that sort of tends to reflect in their environmental relations because they tend to see the animals or the other species as uh, uh, something which is equal and there is no sort of a rigid or a radical separation between the two. Now, for instance, just a child may expect uh, the care of its parents, the environment in a way sort of provides its 
unconditional support. So, that sort of uh, perception of uh, branding nature as or maybe the art as mother, the environment is seen as uh, from the figure of a mother who will in a way provide sort of uh, an unconditional support irrespective of what happened in the past. Now, again in this hunting and gathering societies, uh, the human environmental relations may be described in terms of uh, a generalized reciprocity. Now, this sort of mother-child relationship is uh, something wherein the two do not see any scope of using uh, violence or not just uh, from the perspective of you know uh, exploiting, but rather as more of a protection and reciprocity. So, this sort of uh, metaphors in a way can uh, make sense when we looked at the human environmental relations. Now, for, for instance, again, the, as I had already discussed at length about the Canadian Cree communities, sometimes in a way speaks of themselves as being in communion with nature and animals. Now, perhaps some of the rituals and ceremonies which they have practices are in a way a testimony to this kind of uh, their communion with nature and animals. Now, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, these are pretty much embedded in the hunting activities, which, which are again to be seen as sort of a romantic affair uh, or a love affair, which is frequently uh, happening between where sort of the hunters uh, engage in uh, uh, sort of seducing the prey. Hunters also in this process enter into a relationship with game animals in order to have any success and vice versa. So, in a way the prey tends to sacrifice so as to satisfy the needs of the hunters. So, that, that sort of uh, a romantic affairs in a way is pretty much seen in the hunting activities. It is, it is not something uh, uh, otherwise among the Icelandic fishing economy where that sort of a predator and prey relation exists, but rather the hunters in a way uh, lures or tends to seduce the prey and in return the prey tends to sacrifice and fulfill that sort of promises in order to have uh, successful hunting. Now, also uh, to kill an animal is also to have uh, an engagement or engaging in a dialogue uh, with an in inhabiting the same wild that is sort of the uh, being part of the ecosystem. Animals are also seen to be uh, part of that uh, uh, social world that is if one tends to see from the social theoretical perspective and also uh, human as part of nature. Now, this sort of close affinity or this some symbiotic relationship is something which is uh, predominant uh, in the case of uh, this human and animals uh, which in a way is uh, to be interpreted in this context. Now, again in the hunter's view, there is no fundamental distinctions between nature and society. Now, uh, in a way, if we, if I may use the term altruistic, which is uh, pretty much used by Max Weber, a German uh, sociologist, wherein he says that uh, in altruistic suicide, you tends to you know uh, uh, sort of sacrifice for the uh, betterment or for the good cause. An individual sacrifices one's life for the sake of the society. Or maybe we can also uh, take the examples of uh, the martyrs, uh, a soldier who in a way 
uh, tends to you know commit this kind of suicide by running inside the bunkers of the enemy can be sort of this sort of sacrifice can be seen as alt alt altruistic in nature or altruism. Now, therefore, uh, what I see in these uh, uh, the hunters and the animals uh, discourse is sort of uh, an, an altruistic love or alt altruism in a way prevails, because uh, the animals in a way tends to you know sacrifices uh, in, 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 in the best interest of the other entity that is the human, because they tend to sort of uh, dwell or inhabit the same ecological needs and that sort of demarcation or distinction is not uh, seen. Now, if one discuss uh, also in terms of the relation to land, uh, uh, in the study of Gurevic, uh, he pointed out that uh, in the ancient Scandinavian uh, society, where in there is no sort of uh, a separation between uh, uh, the, cult the, cultivate the cultivator and the land, uh, or maybe the individual and the land which they have cultivated, uh, that, that they, they tend to see sort of uh, an extension of uh, their own nature. The wherein I quote, the fact that a man was uh, thus personally linked with his possession uh, found reflection in a general awareness of the indivisibility of man and the world of nature. Now, therefore, uh, this sort of relationship which is normally witnessed between a land and a cultivator or a a man and uh, the land which they have cultivated. This sort of uh, ideas, the embeddedness with their land, uh, they, they, they tend to you know interpret this relationship, the land as not something which is object, but rather as uh, sort of they are as if part of the nature or they belong to the land. So, this sort of affinity or uh, relationship is best established in the context of uh, the ancient Scandinavian society. Now, similarly, uh, among among different native or agriculture society, this sort of uh, relationship is also being seen. Now, agriculture practices is not to be interpreted as not just simply an economic practice, but uh, the kind of involvement people uh, engages into these uh, practices ultimately appears to be a way of life for them. Now, for them, uh, this possession of land is not just for the to fulfill their economic uh, needs, but also it has tends to save their identity and then their social belongingness to uh, that particular land. Therefore, uh, a different kind of meaning is pretty much manifested, manifested in these relations. Now, social honor again is embodied in land and uh, because uh, uh, the possession of land or the land which they owned in a way also in some sense uh, become a social status or a symbol for that community, because with the amount of land which they which they owned, so is their social standing or status which is being determined. Now, uh, from the perspective of this uh, economic, uh, a pertinent modern example which is uh, normally seen in the economy of livelihood. Uh, which is described again by Goodman and Rivera in the study of the Scandinavian society, uh, again uh, tends to compare with rural Cambodia. Here too, uh, the force of uh, the human body is embodied in the land. Now, it, the, the, that sort of separation between the human and land is not there uh, as what I have discussed earlier in the context of where land is seen as 
uh, the body of a female where it has to be sort of uh, penetrate and then the, uh, wherein the interest the basic interest of the male has to be derived so this is again antithetical to that ideas because the human body is seen to be pretty much embodied in the uh, land which not they own but also uh, the kind of practices which they have done in it. So, in a sense this sort of uh, uh, a sustainable engagement or uh, the kind of relations which they share with the land is something which we need to look here. Now, if the land again is an extension of the human body, uh, which in a way is not replenished as simply the base, will in the long run erode uh, the people and uh, therefore, they tend to in a way uh, sort of engage in an involuntary uh, forceful kind of a migration. Now, if you look at many of the modern uh, ways of agriculture practices, uh, the continuous or the uh, use of uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, fertilizers, chemicals, so on and so forth in a way has uh, desertified the soil and the kind of relations, the harmonious relationship between uh, people and land in a way has changed. So, in one sense, uh, the kind of uh, responsible uh, action which one engages with land will ultimately in a way bring some kind of uh, sustainability. Therefore, uh, uh, one engages in caring or managing the base is a major concern that is the land. Now, exploring uh, if we looked at the idea of uh, communalism in this whole ideas of what we have uh, explained, one can actually uh, situate or locate the spirit of communalism. Now, for instance, to what extent this uh, practical knowledge of uh, the fisherman could be you know brought more systematically in this discussion that is the process of this resource management and this and how does this knowledge differs from the textual knowledge of the professional biologist, which again is guided by this uh, uh, technological scientific knowledge. Now, Pelson uh, in this regard uh, argued that skippers extensive knowledge of the ecosystem within which they operate that is the collective product of this partnership or apprenticeship is the results of years of uh, trial and error that is the practical and skill man and that it would be in a way uh, judicious to you know uh, use this kind of this management purposes in order to engage or look at the closer attention to this knowledge. Therefore, uh, through this we can in a way allow the extreme fluctuation of the ecosystem. Therefore, one alternative way of avoiding this depletion of uh, the fishes in a way is to uh, in a way engage in looking at this uh, knowledge which people have you know learned in the environments they have belonged, but not just simply relying, relying on the knowledge which the biologists or the scientists usually you know addressed. Now, could this sort of practices ultimately would relax the modernist exemption or sort of uh, debunk the idea of this modernist assumption of uh, predictability which is normally associated with the ecological project of sustainability. So, in a way if we would like to you know like talks about the sustainability of the uh, sea ecosystem, one has to allow a space to you know uh, the idea of this practical and skill man of those who are closely associated or inhabiting these uh, areas again. Now, uh, 
uh, by saying so, I am not uh, denying that uh, other forms of knowledge should be totally shunned off or disallowed, but to an uh, extensive uh, to, uh, to some extent, uh, this body of local knowledge has often been you know uh, pushed aside if not uh, eliminated. And uh, in the course of this uh, western uh, expansion and domination, there are good grounds for you know attempting to sort of recapture and preserve uh, what remains of such knowledge that is the references of the indigenous and traditional in such contexts can in a way allow us to reintroduce or reinforce the boundaries of this colonial world. Therefore, uh, this radical separation between nature and society can be narrowed down by allowing the space of this indigenous or traditional knowledge. Now, therefore, this notions of native and primitive again have in a way tends to you know a tendency to congregate in terms of a particular times and uh, location and uh, where does a particular skill or body of knowledge again have to be located to be classified as indigenous. Now, there, there is this is something which is pretty much challenging and and how do we contextualize or bring in a space for this uh, skilled or body of knowledge, which in a way has to be located and classified as indigenous. Now, in conclusion, uh, as we have discussed uh, the three kinds of uh, paradigms that is uh, orientalism, paternalism and communalism in respect to the human environmental relations. Uh, Often, uh, in the modernist assumption of Orientalism, we have also looked at uh, some of the sort of uh, the preconceived notion of human mastery over nature and the nature society interface, and also the distinctions between uh, lay persons and the experts. Now, also we tend to uh, uh, rightly pointed out that there, there, there should be a space to give uh, uh, to the lay persons or the indigenous and local knowledge. So, as these boundaries or the borders which are normally set by the colonialists can be altered if not narrowed down. Now, again this uh, we also have this paternalistic ideas which in a way tends to engaged in the intellectual hires of renaissance, enlightenment and early positivistic science. Uh, for example, the, I had also uh, highlighted about the Descartes uh, anxiety and the uh, Baconian uh, theory of the sexual axiom, all of which in a way has instituted the uh, series of decisive dualism between nature and societies. Now, uh, moreover, uh, orientalism also uh, in a way suggests the absence of reciprocity in human environmental relations has to be in a way later typically presupposes human responsibility and balance reciprocity. Finally, the paradigm of communalism as we had just discussed differs from both orientalism and paternalism in that it sort of rejects the notion of certainty and monologue and the radical separation of nature and society. Now, when it becomes cert, uh, you are so certain and you engage in this monologue, you do not have uh, a space for a dialogue and then uh, everything is pre-fixed and there is no scope for uh, alteration or improvement. So, this idea of certainty and monologue also needs to be relook and uh, reassert uh, or reinvent or maybe uh, I would use the term debunk. Now, unlike paternalism, it emphasizes uh, communalism emphasizes and generalize reciprocity of human environmental relations and exchange which frequently model on close personal relationship. 
nature as not something different but also a part of the social world. Now, again, this paradigm of communalism again emphasize and emphasizes on the idea of practical and skill man, reciprocity, engagement, which in a way eventually provides an avenue out of this modernist project and current environmental dilemmas, which in a way can find an alternative ways and approach. Now, these ideas in a way can adopt the dialogic perspective of communalism to return to not just the post renaissance, but also the pre renaissance pre renaissance area uh, era of this medieval world and also indulge in a naive romanticism also, but uh, rather to uh, embrace a more realistic position uh, by debunking or coming out of this uh, idea of ethnocentric uh, preconception of the uh, modern project that is not just allowing or drawing a boundary of that the anthropological understanding which is guided by uh, colonialism or western science our lives and activities in a way is in inevitably situated in a larger or wider ecological and historical context. Now, uh, to have a much more ideas or a further understanding of these paradigms of uh, environmental human re relations uh, apart from these three paradigms, uh, you can also you know explore more and uh, this discussion is primarily based on these uh, the works of this Lee Pelson and uh, you can refer this for further understanding. Uh, this is the references which I have used. Thank you.